Welcome back to Comic Book Nation, the only show where we have never, ever trusted you. <laughs> Welcome back. Today, we are talking a whole bunch of stuff, including CinemaCon 2024, Fallout has premiered on Amazon Prime, X-Men 97 and Shogun are breaking us emotionally, we have a new Star Wars game, and we got to talk about what the hell is happening in an X-Men comic. Welcome to Comic Book Nation, the only show that does it all for geek culture. I am your host, Kofi Outlaw, and with me today are my co-hosts, Matthew Aguilar and Janelle Wheeler. What's up, guys? Hey, hey. What's up? And joining us are, or is, well, are, I don't know, could be are, <laughs> could be is, but it is, Evan Valentine, one of the hosts of Anime Initiative, our new anime segment, which is killing it on the feeds right now. But uh, Evan does a lot more than just anime, and he's joining us today to help us cover all these things in geek culture. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, this was this is a jam packed episode. I, I I thank you for bringing me on to talk about everything that has happened. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a lot. It's been a lot, <laughs> and I forgot even half of it, and I had to cram it in before the show started. So if you are just listening on audio, as our uh, super fan Damon Gray pointed out, uh, yeah. I had a mask on in the beginning. I was uh, celebrating the uh, Metro Boom in future. Uh, we still don't trust you. Release day. Happy release day to everybody celebrating 2024 rap beefs right now. But the uh, <laughs> rap, you know, hip hop nation is is we don't have time for hip hop nation today. Those are things we usually argue about before the show. You guys don't get it, know this, Very but true. there is a very violent schism in hip hop nation which is not as friendly as comic book nation. When we all sign on, there have been times when we've been like, man, everybody shut up and start the show. Cause we can't talk anymore because of hip hop stuff. So that's some behind <laughs> the scenes drama for you, but we never trusted you just know that. But as I said today, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, CinemaCon 2024 is going on and there's been some big reveals. It is CinemaCon's trying to make a comeback out there in Las Vegas. And so we already had a bonus episode for one big thing that happened there, but we got to talk about the rest We've also got to talk about Fallout on Prime. Another thing, we have bonus episodes out on the feeds right now. You can go check out our longer spoiler-filled and non-spoiler-filled discussions about Fallout. But, you know, this is a live show, baby. This is our hub, and we got to talk about it here with everybody. And, uh, yeah, we got to catch up with TV because this week, Shogun and, and X-Men uh, 97 arguably should be, you know, charged with emotional battery. So we'll get into all of that. All right, right up at the top, though, the thing I forgot this week, my week started off on a happy note. There was a solar eclipse on Monday, uh, so we were in the path, and we were in eclipsed in darkness for a while, and then that moved on, and I said, you know, what should I do with the rest of my day? And I was like, you know what, let's go do a feel-good event, so I went to go see Alex Garland's new movie, Civil War. Uh, and yeah. Civil War is, as you know, the title says, is a vision of an American second Civil War uh, this movie is set in the last days or or the waning days of the Civil War when the White House in the in kind of embattled president is about to be brought down by one of the military factions of this war. Uh, and these photojournalists, Kristen, uh, Kirsten Dunst and, uh, you know, Kaylee Spaney from um, what's my what do we just see the Elvis movie? What was that called? Uh, it's the name Priscilla, Priscilla. Oh, Priscilla. And, yeah, and uh, and another guy from blanking on his name, and I don't have the movie pulled up, so stall for a time. Um, but yeah, they are photojournalists, and they're all trying to get to Washington D.C. so they can be the first. Uh, Wagner Mora, M Wagner Moera, uh, is, uh, and they're all three excellent as these photojournalists. But they're trying to get to D.C. and Stephen McKinley Henderson from Dune, Dune One, famously cut out of Dune Two, and and capture the story of what happens when the president is brought down. So obviously we're not going to get too, too crazy. This isn't political nation. Uh, this is comic book nation, but Alex <laughs> Gardlin, you know, obviously is so fanboy adjacent with movies like ex machina and annihilation. He also wrote things like 28 days later. So this guy has been kind of working in genre for a long time. He's known to a lot of fans. This is his biggest project yet. And obviously his most, He's been taking a turn to the socio-political. He did Men, his last film, which kind of had mixed reactions, but was still very much a pronounced socio-political commentary. And this one, obviously, even more so. Um, all right. So I gave this four out of five stars. 
uh, because I think that what Garland does here, and he is a UK, UK born director, he is not American. People have been kind of getting all up in arms about that. Ah, he's talking about American, not American, but like he's not. But he does it. This isn't a political film. Obviously, there's always human political bias and things like that. We're all human and we come from context. And so things might leak in. But what this movie does is, first of all, it creates a portrait of the Civil War that's purposefully complicated. There's like a Western front, which is California, Texas. People are spazzing about that. They're like, California, Texas would never get together. It's like, guys, what are we fighting for here? Are we fighting for an actual Civil War? Is that what we want here? But anyway... But that kind of purposely murks the waters about our standard political kind of, you know, knee jerks. It's that there are just these different factions and there's like four or five of them. There's like a Maoist colony in Portland or something like that. So there's these different factions around the country and they're all just disagreeing. If that's what it's about. Nobody dis nobody can agree anymore. Everybody started grabbing, you know, arms and, and going at it. So the journalists are just trying to get from New York to D.C., which is this crazy journey. They got to go through Pittsburgh and then swing in through West Virginia because of the battle. And it's about their journey and what they see along the journey. So it's not about politics, it's not about any of that, but what it does, and why you should see this movie in IMAX, I think, is Alex Garland takes our, our now America. This isn't some future dystopia. It's right now America as if it were in the middle of a battlefield like Gaza or something like that. And that imagery is so striking. This is a very hard watch. I don't know how many people would ever wanna, it's, it's hard to seek this movie out and say, yeah, that's what I want to go and turn on right now. I get that. It was hard for me to go out and see it, you know, as a screening. I was like, okay, eclipse day, let's go do this next. And, you know, I wasn't thrilled about it, but um, it turned out to be an important movie to see because it has the effect, ironically, and it uses photo, photo journalism in this kind of deep rumination on the value of the press, but also kind of how the press can be this thankless job of trying to create some kind of important content that gets misconstrued or not understood or or doesn't ultimately become worth the value of what you sacrificed your soul to get that one requote that one picture that one thing and so it, it it's about kind of that but seeing it, ironically you know we are a very visual culture now like we, we don't get things we're not reading things and like absorbing history we have to see things and when you see like American strip malls and, you know, highway sides and major cities and rural towns and all of this split by war and a very convincing and visually well done portrait of war. It's it, it messes you up. It's pretty jarring. It's scary. And it's scary on like a different level. It's like, yeah, we all fantasize about political frustration, social frustrations. Oh, those other people, if we could just uh, get rid of them, you know. But like when you see it playing out in just scenes of people just trying to clean up the bodies and 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 do all that, like it's terrifying. It, it, and, and it makes you say, yeah, yeah, maybe we should sit down and figure out how to be like less at this because you realize like, yeah, it's at once like this could be my country. But then you realize like this is a lot of countries where people this is everyday life and it's it's pretty nuts. And so. It's another one of those Alex Garland things that is entertaining as a genre piece because it's literally just a nightmare road trip from point A to point B. And every stop along the way is a little parable kind of mini lesson. There's like, you see in the Jesse Plemons character who is, again, terrifying. Um, you see, but there's this one scene that stuck with me. It's just like these two guys, they're outside of a big house and somebody's trying to snipe at them and the journalists. And the journalists are trying to interview them and they're like, okay, so what side are you fighting for? And like, what is the thing? And what's your mission here? And they're like, sarcastically, these two guys are just like, buddy, there's a guy shooting at us. We're shooting at him. Yeah. He's trying to kill us. We're trying to kill him. There's your quote. Like that's welcome. Welcome to our situation. And it's like that thing. And so that's like a stop for people who they go to a town where everybody's pretending nothing happens and until they kind of see the sinister underbelly. So that's what it's about. And it's about how just like real America, we would be split in the middle of war. It's not a clean like it used to be north and south. It's like, yeah, there would be this group and this group and this group and this group and everybody. It would be a mess. And so it's an important movie, a hard to watch movie. Um, but Alex Garland is top of his game. And this is the greatest directorial thing. I mean, he's done because he usually is kind of, you know, he's kind of small scale. Annihilation started to get a little bigger. But like I said, the imagery in this needs to be seen on an IMAX screen. Some of these pictures will mess you up forever. And yeah, 
I just want to be in a friendlier country after seeing it. I don't enjoy this anymore. This uh, vitriol is not healthy, and, I, and I've seen now a vision of where it leads, and I'm, I'm personally terrified. So, oh, uh, yeah. I think that I that's think the that theme of today's Alex, episode. With, <laughs> yeah, emotional battery this week. Yeah, with with Alex Garland, I I've always found that um, you had kind of mentioned that w with like the receiving of men, because like I personally I love like some of my favorite sci-fi movies are Annihilation and Ex Machina. I think that the imagery that he was able to convey with those movies, as well as the stories of them really hit hard and i still think about them on the regular uh i wasn't a big fan of men which is kind of tragic because like he based some of it on attack on titan anime shout out he is a big fan of anime in general so like he did take inspiration from that i think it wasn't able to hit as well as it could have but it did have striking imagery i think that with um i haven't seen civil war i'm looking forward to seeing it i think that even if Maybe the story doesn't hit. I find it funny that like the first trailer that they released was like Texas and California have teamed up. And it's like, really? Those two have teamed up? Uh, that, <laughs> that was kind of funny in general. But I know that like the imagery, like Kofi had said, like the imagery of it, I'm sure is going to be very striking and haunting. He's very good at that. Um, I have heard reports that like he's thinking about retiring from filmmaking, which would really, which would really suck. Like I might not have liked men as much as his previous works, but like, I hope he keeps directing and I will give this money to make sure that he gets the message that please keep directing movies, Alex. It's you make good stuff. It's worth seeing. Yeah. I mean, I hope he, if he doesn't want to direct and because it's too much of an undertaking, I hope he keeps writing because mm -hmm. the man's imagination and his ability to mix like kind of sim surface level simplistic genre things like ex machina programmer goes to a guy's house his boss's house for like a couple days and then you know what happens over those days but and then add these layers to them is is really impressive so yeah i guess of a war if it's not easy but this is an important year probably to do it and to consider a lot of things and i hope a lot of people do go seek it out and don't let it get buried in either side of film Twitter's political political Twitter's crazy, exploitive, nonsense noise machine. Because I've heard even some pundits are losing their minds out of here. And we won't we won't name them, you know, who are having their, you know, anyway, we won't name them. But some people have been like losing their minds at this movie. But I think every person should see it. It's a movie about the horrors of war. I think that's something all of us can think about and relate to. So check it out if you want. All right, so that's one emotional battery point done. Yay! Let's go to one that wasn't <laughs> so emotionally battering and talk about that, which is CinemaCon 2024. Uh, it's happening in Las Vegas. Each studio is kind of coming up and uh, pro uh, I can't think of the word right now, presenting their slate of upcoming films. And this is kind of a pivotal year because a lot of studios are trying to get back in the game of of getting premium content, very controlled spending, very, you know, better bets on things that are going to put time and work in and are going to be big hits. That's what everybody's getting back to the old Bob Iger style of doing this after the kind of flood of the streaming wars and the overspending and the pumping up half ass content everywhere. So kind of a big year to kind of see if we're steering the ship in a new direction. Warner Brothers was kind of first up, and like I said, we did an immediate reaction to this, but we not have not heard from the one person we may need to hear the most from, which is Janelle Wheeler. She's already smiling. You know I'm coming to you. <laughs> the the uh, trailer for Joker, Folie à deux, has dropped, and Janelle, what did you think about it? I love him saying everything. <laughs> yeah, I avoid saying the name because I'm kind of like... Everybody I'm, is now. Everybody's yeah. non-French is showing. <laughs> Yeah. I'm like so freaked out I'm going to say something wrong. After going to France for the first time and trying to be that American, like ordering off the menu and they were like, just stop. We speak English. I'm just going to not. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised. I actually am not. I know I have a musical background, but I don't like the musical thing. It it just is is weird to me. I don't like them. I don't I was not on board for the Mean Girls musical situation. Um, and so I don't know, I was, I, I, I feel like I was kind of very timid about this, but after this trailer, I do feel more, um, committed to it. I do feel more intrigued by it. I don't feel 
overwhelmed or uncomfortable about the music aspect because they're not really showing like Broadway, we're going to dance down the street and <laughs> like sing what we're doing. Like I'm walking, I'm taking three steps and then I'm going to do a turn and say hi. Um, so I actually studied musical theater in college, by the way, that's my degree. But um, yeah, I'm actually, first of all, really surprised with how much of kind of like the background they show, like leading up to, you know, Harley and Joker coming together. Um, I'm adoring their chemistry. I'm feeling it like just in this little trailer. I still don't really know exactly what everything is about, but I don't care. I'm so intrigued that I'm just like, the it's about the characters. It's about Harley and Joker. And I want to know what they're doing with these characters. It does feel like obviously the musical aspect is going to be like in their own minds. It's not actually like a musical. It's like more of like mentally deranged musical numbers in their head. And that is really cool. Like that's very intriguing and it makes sense and I don't hate it. <laughs> so yeah, I'm pumped. Okay. There's Janelle's take in, yeah, it could be a hard sell for Janelle. I mean, you are yeah. a very big Jared Leto Joker fan, and and that taken, you were very selective in your Joker. So it's kind of good to hear in you. General, that... though, I love Joker in general. Oh yeah, you do, you do. Unless but you, like, you just said... ruin it. <laughs> so. Yeah, and then you're not, and then you're not down at all. But like, yeah, <laughs> um, and I think that's if you go back and listen to our our immediate reactions to the trailer, that's kind of the consensus we all got to. It's like even people who don't like Joker in this week. Holy crap. Some of y'all have just come out of the woodwork letting me know that people in my life are such animate non-Joker fans. Like, Wow. Yeah, but um, even those people have been like, okay, but I'm morbidly curious to see what this is going to be now. Like, Totally. If it, and I think Matt said it best, like if it had just been another Joker, just another Joaquin Phoenix, not so down. But add in the Gaga, Harley st angle, and the music, the weird kind of musical line they're walking and now you got me i want to see evan how did you feel about this her. I, I love that they didn't tease any gaga singing i think that's so brilliant because you have to just wait for it yeah that's the main event you know give that, mm -hmm. give that yeah you know you give away the sizzle not the steak uh, yeah. evan evan how did you feel about this and and how what are your thoughts because we have you know as we said our joker episode and i and i stress this again go back to season one of our podcast feed Go look up the Joker <laughs> review episode and hear comic book nearly split down the middle over this film. Yeah, I was angry. <laughs> yeah. I, how did you, how do you, what's your Joker take, Evan? So, so it's funny because um, the, the filmmakers behind the original Joker, the, the way that they kind of approached the Joker to start with is that they had a story to tell that they wanted to tell that they effectively said, okay, they said to Warner Brothers, okay, what characters do you have that can fulfill this story that we're looking to tell? And they're like, maybe you can do the Joker. And they're like, okay, well, we can like put him in. So I know, Kofi, you had kind of mentioned that you were like, well, there are some people who, are, who you know who like aren't necessarily like Joker fans. And I think that this take on the Joker is effectively made for people who aren't Joker fans. I think that he's so different. It's like, yes, he wears the makeup. He has the garish outfit. We are getting a Harley Quinn and Lady Gaga. But the story of Arthur Fleck is so different. Like, the first movie was effectively kind of a mix between uh, Taxi Driver and I think it's called, like, The Comedian. Um, and yeah. it kind of blends, blends those together. Uh, so I'm anxious to see where this one is going. I think that, like... The fact that, you know, Janelle kind of mentioned it, it is interesting in the fact that they don't have Lady Gaga singing at all. Like, it, it's 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 a good hook. I don't know. It's so funny that, like, the, the way that some studios market movies where they're trying to hide the fact that it's a musical, I think that it's so funny that some people are, like, standoffish about that. I think, like, if you're able to tell a really good story and you're able to incorporate musical aspects into it, that kind of works. And we'll see if this is all taking place inside of their heads. I think there's certainly an argument to be made for that, especially like with the events of the first movie and how one character was an entirely a fictional character created inside of Arthur's head. Um, but I'm looking forward to, I've always been a big proponent when it comes to comic book adaptations to go nuts with them. We like, if you don't like, a certain interpretation of a character on screen like you can just kind of ignore it like it's there 
but you'll always have the comics there for you to kind of read and everything. So like, I'm anxious to see what's in store for Arthur and Harley Quinn and how they kind of, you know, different differentiate everything. And will there be a Batman in this? Like of, Apparently, this takes place maybe years after the original one, and they were setting that up, and how different would a Batman be in this world? Who knows? I'm anxious to see, though. Yeah, all right. See, like I said, everybody, morbidly curious, and mm. that's what we like to hear. So, that was Joker. You can go listen to our full, immediate reactions to the breakdowns of the trailer over on the Comic Book Nation feeds and on our comicbook.com uh, YouTube page. So let's kind of move on into other things that happened at CinemaCon 2024. Um, we had a uh, phase zero host, Brandon Davis was out kind of covering CinemaCon for us. And so he got to see all the things and he got to see the Marvel stuff. We know what you get that you guys are all thrilled about hearing about. So that included Deadpool and Wolverine and, you know, Captain American, uh, Captain America, New World Order. Oh, God, it's such a mouthful. Um, yeah, so BD kind of broke down the footage that we saw for Deadpool. He basically said that it looks pretty epic. Kevin Feige even said it was effing awesome. It's going to be effing awesome. And they kind of did a whole play up. You can read it on comicbook.com, Marvel, where, you know, Deadpool's teasing things like, you know, who's going to be in Secret Wars? And Wolverine comes in and is talking about his phone. And then, you know, you got, and then they get like a little sizzle reel. And I think they got to see nine minutes of the film, like the, in the opening where Wade Wilson's like having his uh, birthday party and, you know, hanging out with Peter and, and his friends. And then he gets to meet uh, Matthew uh, Successions, Matthew McFadden as the TVA agent. Uh, what's his name? Um, Paradox. Paradox. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they, and then it's just, it basically sells us on this whole idea of the references we're going to get the kind of witty fourth wall breaks. It looks like Hugh Jackman's getting in on it. We've seen Hugh Jackman's yellow Wolverine costume, both in promotional photos and the people who saw the trailer got to see a shot of it. Everything apparently looks awesome. It looks like it's going to be like pretty much the multiversal event we were waiting for this whole time. Um, and we'll kind of like move things in the Fox movie universe and, and kind of start that sync up with the MCU which is a subject I really do want to get into today as, as we're talking about other things. But um, sounds pretty interesting. But the, I think the more surprising thing was hearing that Captain America Brave New World looks like it's going to be people are already calling it like the next Winter Soldier, which I was like, oh, we already going there. Like, OK, um, all it's right. A high but, bar. Yeah, it's a high Julia, bar. <laughs> director Julius Ona has apparently put together some real hot action. Um, we got the answer to how, you know, they're going to deal with Harrison Ford. They're basically doing an Iron Man two where he comes in and they're like, yo, you look different. And he's like, ah, I had to shave the mustache, you know, cause he's a president. He's running for president now. And so that's the joke. He shaved the mustache and now he looks completely different. And, you know, that's a funny lighthearted way, uh, to kind of get around it. If you don't know Harrison Ford and William Hurt, were like, you know, friends and colleagues in real life. So that's a nice, like little touching kind of funny tribute to him. But yeah, we hear that uh, the action's badass. Isaiah Bradley's getting on it. You know, Falcon and Winter Soldier, Carl Lumby, uh, as uh, Isaiah Bradley is going to be, you know, the black Captain America. Best part of that game. show. Yeah, for real. And he's going to get some pretty badass action sequencing in here. So that sounds pretty good. But I, I was kind of, I was surprised to hear that, like, the espionage action, the thrills and all of that were as hard hitting as, as at least BD and other people from CinemaCon said they were right like i mean anybody else surprised by captain america not Matt? at all <laughs> not, i'm not surprised <laughs> wow okay you guys yeah you guys are still more hopeful about the mcu than me this is what i'm this is what i'm finally we know like, this yes yeah. yeah we just yeah. gotta roll the we just gotta roll that back just a little bit okay that's a that's a i've heard other movies compared to that before that is still my all-time favorite MCU movie for a reason it holds up upon Still numerous rewatchings yep. uh so to compare it to that you know I, I I I would love it because I've been wanting another one of those for a while so uh also the suit you know from from all intents and purposes of uh you know the image they released a first image right and then there's been some other stuff going around um 
you know, that looks, that looks good. I love the line about, uh, you know, I'm not Steve, right. That whole exchange between them. Um, so that's, that's also great. Uh, it, it sounds, it sounds good. I'm hopeful. They, they kind of, this is a very pivotal movie for the yeah, MCU. So it's got to deliver. A, yeah. There's also a line about him possibly, you know, Sam Wilson having to build the next Avengers. So there's a right. lot going on. I mean, Brave New World seems to be the right title for this. Y'all were a lot Strange. more hopeful than I was. You know, sometimes I wish I could curse on this podcast because I would just say <laughs> F it to all three of you. Be good. <laughs> I don't know who who am I with? I don't know. Quote I aliens. To build you know, to quote <laughs> aliens, how do I get out of this shitty outfit? You know, <laughs> stow that, Hudson. All right. Speaking of alien, alien Romulus was also shown. Uh, Matt, oh, that's right. Try to keep it uh, off the rundown because he's scared. But alien Romulus was shown at. Uh, at um, CinemaCon 2024, and that's Fede Alvarez, the director of uh, Don't What Is It? Don't Speak. Yeah, Don't uh, Speak don't, and uh, and Evil Dead. Don't Breathe. Don't Breathe and Evil Dead remake. Don't, don't Speak. Breathe. Sorry, that's Stop what it. I think every <laughs> time. Stop it. Uh, <laughs> don't breathe every don't, time. So it's like, Don't Breathe and the Evil Dead remake. And Fede is known for being like hard as hard hitting gets in horror and gore and scares and gross outs. And uh, it sounds like alien Romulus is going to deliver on all of that. Um, it's pretty gnarly. We heard just basically it's going to be a face hugger fest. People are going to get gnarly alien scenes, which is none of this is kind of reinventing the wheel, right? Like this is all what we got originally from aliens. But when you do go back and kind of look at it, like we haven't really seen it kind of put that way that hard hitting right in that nightmarish kind of with many face huggers many kind of gore and things the closest we got was avp but that was pg-13 so they oh kind of had to scale that down please yeah. don't remind us of alien versus <laughs> listen listen yo wait a minute wait a minute wait hold on hold on hold on today's grenade apparently is the fact that i for all intents and purposes think that aliens versus predator ranks higher than most of a lot of the predator and aliens and definitely the second alien versus predator movie. It's pretty oh, high well, up there. For I mean, me. that's a low bar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Requiem. Yeah. ABP Requiem is one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. Um, yeah. It's higher than alien three for sure. Higher than maybe, maybe even higher than predator two. Uh, oh, definitely no. higher than. The oh no. Predator. Not, you can't bad mouth Danny Glover, man. No, Come Danny Glover's now. like, Danny Glover's like would maybe be. I think I'd put Predator Two right after under AVP for Sanai Lathan as like the heroine of that movie, fighting a queen with a predator at the end, getting her battle scar. Like, come on, man, that was that was a hard movie. And the and the premise of that was great. The the labyrinth that turned into a trap because the predators were using aliens for training. Like all of that story, Paul W S Anderson wasn't crazy, man. Here's, um, here's the thing. My heart can't take another bad alien movie as, <laughs> as, a, as a big fan of the franchise. And and Damon Gray actually said it. What about the most recent Predator? And I was going to bring that up is that oh, if Prey. you haven't seen Prey, for the love of God, oh, watch Prey really good. because it's arguably the best uh, Predator movie outside of the first one. Ask me on a certain day and I might put it over Predator 1. I know that's blasphemy, but I might. Like, no, if, you if have you lost me your at the mind. right time. I might put prey over. Uh, ah, you are predator. losing your mind. Predator one is the <laughs> one of the most rewatchable and like perfect movies ever created. Like it's, I just it's watched true. it the other day because I couldn't think of anything else to watch. And I was like, what do I do? And I was having like one of those content spasms. And I was like, uh, well, there's always Predator. Predator Press predator's play. always always there yeah. for you. I, I agree. I agree. I said ask me on the right day. But um Prey with, was like awesome. with, <laughs> with with uh Prometheus and with Ugh. Alien what was it like? Alien Covenant. Covenant. Just Ugh. oh man, like uh Alien needs a win, man. And it, and it's yeah. just like I, I I'm a big fan of uh for, for the longest time Fede Alvarez um he did the impossible where for the longest time me being a giant evil dead fan uh the idea of remaking evil dead at that point was kind of blasphemy but he was able to make one of the greatest horror remakes of all time like he's not oh doesn't God. top john carpenter's the thing but it's still an amazing remake of that oh original story makes it more hardcore um and i will never I'm, forget I'm the theater for that Everybody in the oh. theater was screaming and covering their eyes and being like, oh, my God. Like, yeah, 
that was one of the gnarliest theatrical experiences I've ever seen. So good. Like, so yeah. I'm I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt on this. I hope my fingers are crossed because Lord knows the world needs another good alien movie. I'm down for it. I'm crossing my fingers on it. And it sounds like we're going to get a bunch of younger characters trapped in a very tight space on a ship facing a horde of aliens and trying to survive. And when you think about it, that's really what we need. There's two things this franchise does, body horror and kind of isolation claustrophobic horror really well. So hope we get that. All right. Anybody else got strong thoughts on Alien? Matt, there were no helmets in the, in the footage, so I know you're, you're ready for the next thing. What do you guys think uh, Marvel's Thunderbolts with an asterisk means? Because that was a big thing. That's about all we got from Thunderbolts, really. But, uh, yeah, there's an asterisk at the end of the official title, which movie companies need to stop getting cute with these titles. Let me tell you. Like, if somebody has to write these things up, <laughs> we hate writing them, and we are just going to skip to, like, regular Thunderbolts every time. But uh, for Marvel's purposes, there is an asterisk, and it's supposed to mean something. What do you guys think it means? I, I it better mean Dark Avengers. Yeah, <laughs> it could be a million things. I I just I feel like they're putting stuff like that out there to troll us. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people think it is, and I think like by the end of this film, like it'll they'll take out the Thunderbolts thing, and it'll become like the official Dark Avengers, yeah. or or Secret Avengers, and they'll be the next ones. Um, there's also that rumor that they could all die. And so like Thunderbolts could be an asterisk just because they're not around anymore by the end of the film. Uh, I'll be which, pissed about that. If that happens, cause that's you kill Yelena. No, you better not. I'm going to be so mad. <laughs> if listen, Yelena dies, you know, sure she'll you know my feelings survive. You know, my feelings. Yeah. But Florence Pugh is probably like ready to get out of here. Like she's too old for the, for the young Avengers. So, you know, as much as people want that, uh, MCU needs to stay dangerous. That's my whole thing. Like the MCU. Well, Dark Avengers are completely separate. Why can't she be a Dark Avenger? She could. She could be the Black Widow of Dark Avengers. Like that's yeah. Easy. So um, what's wrong with that? Like I want her to stick all around. of you don't want her to die is exactly why she needs to maybe die because Marvel needs to get dangerous. You all need to be mad again. You need to be fired up. You need that's to be not like, how ah. you get. You don't kill one of your best characters. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you just stay don't tuned, make the most boring for, uh, choice. You have There's actually nothing. a middle ground. You will never. There's a middle ground. Out. No, you if you're gonna say secret, if secret evasion, if secret evasion, make the most boring choice, and you turn someone that no one cares about, that's the boring stuff. That's what I'm talking about. There's a whole middle ground in between where you don't have to go kill one of your best characters, like one of the best things you've done in the past five years. Give me a break. That's so dumb. <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> to quote a great man. Anyway. To quote a great man, if she dies, Stupid. she dies. All right. <laughs> and you right, learn nothing. You will, no, you will never rule Japan. You learn nothing from this week's Shogun, which we will get to in the second. I don't want to rule Japan. You know why? You Japan has failed me so fight. many times in risk. It's ridiculous. You know how many times I've taken over Japan in risk and never won? Get out of I mean, here. I believe that. But, like, yeah. All right. You know what? <laughs> Listen, the queen's sacrifice sometimes has to be made if you want to be the Shogun, okay? You got to be willing to go these places. All right, so, Matt, now that you've gotten all fired up and mouthing off, why don't you talk about what Paramount did and the big thing that we got confirmed there? I'm happy. I'm happy. My, my attitude, my current Clearly. attitude wouldn't tell you, but I'm happy because we're getting a Transformers G.I. Joe crossover, and if you watched the last Transformers movie, which you should have because it was dope, then you know they set up a G.I. Joe thing and everyone's been like, so we're going to get it? Are we going to get it? And hey, it's happening. I'm very excited about that. No other details on that as other than like, hey, it's actually going to happen. We'll see. You know, you always hold out a little bit of, uh, you know, a caveat in case like, you know, they just go, nah, it's canceled. But hopefully that's not the case. So I'm excited for that. Also, if you're not reading the current Skybound comics and seeing what the potential of the that universe is, you should because man, G.I. Joe and Transformers being in the same world is fun. Um yeah. so I'm I'm very yeah. excited for that. It yeah, the comics are the main reason why, not so much the films, but the comics are the main reason why I'm excited for this. The Energon universe happening in Skybound is amazing, and it really kind of makes you realize how well these two 80 cartoons go together. 
because if giant robots were showing up on Earth, it would take a specialized military force to deal with that and fight with them. And the Transformers movies already kind of did that, where Tyrese and them were kind of GI right. Joe. So it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be so crazy and. Yeah, it's going to be good. And wh why are we still talking about Michael Bay in the comments? Michael Bay's Transformers is so far gone. We've had Bumblebee. Now we had um, Rise, Rise of, of the Beast, Beast son. Which was so much better. <laughs> so we're on so much better ground right now. It's like we're having a Halo argument again. This stuff is yeah. that's the old era. We're in a new era. Come, come but that's not the only Transformers thing either. Like Speaking of that new era, nope. right? Like we're, yeah. we're jumping into an animated movie. Uh, Transformers 1, which, you know, has a stacked cast, a lot of actually MCU crossover with Hemsworth <laughs> and uh, Johansson being in there. But this one is like, we've seen the origin of, like, we've seen early days of Cybertron in, like, video games and in comics uh, and even in the movies, you know, sometimes. Uh, we've seen, like, early days of Optimus and various shows, Megatron. But this one is really, like, trying to, like, take you all the way back to when they weren't even able to transform like this is how far back this project goes it's like part of the film is actually watching like optimus and megatron and alita one and stuff get like get that ability because it's something you actually have to like earn in that universe and they're finding the matrix of leadership right like that's not even in place like there's so much early stuff here you're really gonna see cybertron before the wars and how vibrant it was and all those things that other things in the genre have given you an idea of but this one is really like diving into it full on and from what i've heard i haven't seen obviously the only the footage actually i don't think we have to wait super long for the first trailer on this if i'm mistaken i think it's later this month um but the footage is very much described as like kind of a something different from like the pixar and mutant mayhem and spider verse aesthetic like it's it's kind of supposedly found its own vibe so i'm i'm very curious to see what that looks like uh so yeah i'm very excited for transformers one um and so it's gonna be it looks like it's gonna be a big day for transformers fans but i know kovey was very excited or i i i, I assume you were excited about the star trek thing are you are you happy about this yeah, I'm just coming up next. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. There's so much. Star Trek is getting like kind of DC right now in which there's so many different lanes of projects. There's like the Star Trek TV universe, the Star Trek TV universe, plus standalone films in the TV universe, plus a whole Star Trek movie wing that is still developing. But we got the announcement at CinemaCon that we're going to be getting a Star Trek origin movie which is going to be set before, you know, the Star Trek origin movie of 2009 that we got. So this is going to be like, you know, something, I think this is like literally like about like Starfleet, Star Trek, you know, all of this and how it kind of came about or how it kind of got off the ground. So it's going to be interesting to see what goes on there. Um, because like I said, Star Trek is like literally, it's kind of like Star Wars right now, in which it's beginning to splinter out into these further things like with discovery on one end of the future. Now this is going to be going back further. And then a bunch of projects kind of in between we have star fleet Academy, which is coming after discovery, which is also going to be set in that future. And so like we're spreading out the franchise and doing all that, but it's getting to be a lot to keep track of, man. Like I can't, I can't remember half of this stuff. I'm mainly excited and we didn't talk about it on here. Um, but the section 31 movie with, um, with our girl, Michelle, yo is, is the thing I'm most excited about coming down the pike next because that's about, you know, mm. the Black Ops wing of Starfleet and Michelle Yeoh's character is Ooh. amazing. And so, like, yeah, I'm excited about that. But this is interesting because this could be, you know, a very formative kind of way to get new people into Star Trek, obviously, and and kind of build out from there and do something a little different while we get to getting to something very familiar. But that wasn't the biggest head scratcher of the Paramount pre presentation, which was... You know, now I'd say chin scratches because chin scratches suggest intrigue, right? But uh, yeah. just kind of wrap this up. It was something Matt also didn't put on the list, but definitely should have because he was so excited about it. Uh, Ronin, the last Ronin, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the last Ronin. That oh, movie, yes, I did forget to put that. <laughs> is getting a rated R movie adaptation. So if you had rated R Ninja Turtles on your bingo card this year, I need to play the lottery with you. But... I did not, so I am really intrigued by this. How about you guys? Uh, oh, I boy. think that one of the things, because I've talked with some folks 
who are Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fans, and they go, well, why would they make like an R-rated Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? And I'm like, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles started initially in the comics right. as a very R-rated thing. It was only oh, yeah. after a couple of years that they were given a cartoon where all of their headbands, were, all their masks were different colors, and they were cracking wise, and they were eating pizza. They did not eat pizza in the original comic book series. They just stabbed people. They uh, Yeah, it was real foot- ninja stuff. <laughs> It was serious the, ninja stuff. The original <laughs> Foot Clan, they weren't robots, and they didn't just kick them. They uh, they did a lot of ninja stuff, as Kofi said. Um, the last Ronin, specifically, is a... And um, for those who don't know, the last Ronin is a comic book series that was released in uh, recent years that documents one turtle of the four brothers uh, was able to survive and now lives in kind of like a post-apocalyptic dystopian future setting now don't uh, spoil who it is because oh yeah, i think we're actually going to gonna read I'm this spoil which one it is <laughs> but okay. they don't tell you until about like i think at the end of issue one or two they tell you which turtle it actually was but said turtle is using all the different weapons of the teenage mutant ninja turtles and uh you eventually kind of walk through how the tur- each of the other turtles died how they perished as well as kind of setting up future storylines. Um, I think the thing that really took me for the biggest loop with this is that it is going to be live action. And my my hope of hopes in my heart, I'm really hoping that this is kind of a uh, unofficial sequel to the original 80s movies. And uh, Paramount, puts, uh... Paramount puts a guy in a suit. Please do this. Please don't awesome. have it be a CG thing. Just take one of those old suits, make it look a little older, and like that'll be it'll save money. Everybody wants I, I, I would have to imagine everybody wants that, where you could just have somebody in the prosthetics and everything. I think that would be super cool. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. I hope I'm looking forward to see what it looks like and everything. But yeah, it should it should be cool. Yeah. I think, um, and and I've seen it in the comments too. I actually, I was already thinking about doing this uh, when the video game got announced. Because remember, we're also getting a video game based on like this is becoming a, its own universe. We have a spinoff series in the comics that shows you what happened to all the turtles and all that stuff. Like, there's this universe has grown a lot just from this one story. Uh, and I was already thinking about doing one of the things we did for Supergirl: Woman of Tomorrow with this book of having us all read it. And I think with especially with this announcement i think that would be a good idea uh because this universe ain't going away do we and have this the is going to be uh well see last time i got everybody supergirl books by the way it's just you i hold because i just value your friendship so much and i just want your stuff in a box you're Close sick you're sick <laughs> So, uh, I, uh, yeah, I think we should totally do that. that that'd be a thing. Cause this isn't going away and I'm very excited and I agree with you, Evan. I love even, even with like the horror that is the meme where you can see the person inside. Was it Donatello's suit yeah. <laughs> where the, the, where the photo was taken at just the right time? Even with the like awfulness that is that picture, I still love that aesthetic overall. And I would love to see them you know, jump into that. I'm also surprised it's live action, but I'm very excited. So thank you, Kofi, for bringing that to my attention because uh, (laughs) I forgot. I totally forgot. All right. Well, just to close it out before we take a break, uh, John Wick franchise also continues with the ballerina. And we got to see some of that. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I mean, the John Wick thing has kind of cooled off for me. Expanding this universe hasn't been the greatest since we uh, got through John Wick four, which was, you know, action masterpiece, but Continental was trash. Oh my God. So I'm not really, I don't know how these spinoffs are going to go, but I'm always going to, I'm always curious. So, and again, I guess I'll be hopefully optimistic on that, but you can check out more about what we saw from that film on comicbook.com movies. All right. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we got to hop over the small screen. We got to talk about something new with fallout and things that are going on in X-Men and Shogun. Plus Matt has an agenda and I have a little agenda too. Uh, somebody asking in the comments, when are we getting those comic book nation shirts shipped out? <laughs> well, that's a season one and two question. Uh, Jim Biscard is gone. We couldn't Jim even find him for me. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Jim is gone. The shirts are gone. Our office is currently gone. Like, I don't even know those. He did. Questions. He has them all. Jim took yeah. all the shirts. You're, you're <laughs> asking questions from the before four times. This is this is the fallout wasteland. He's selling Welcome them on back. the side of the road. <laughs> yeah. You should have never trusted us. Out of the He's door. got, like, car. firewood. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> we'll be right back. Welcome back to Comic Book Nation, the only show that does it all for geek culture and the official podcast of comicbook.com. If you missed our first half, we broke down the new movie release, Civil War, and talked about all the biggest things that happened at CinemaCon 2024. Now we're going over to the TV side, and the first thing we're going to do is talk about the new Amazon Prime show, Fallout, adapting the Bethesda Studios game series for the live-action TV series man good podcasting wordplay today you speak so good all right but uh this <laughs> this series is adapting of you know a very popular popular 2010s you know primarily game series uh one that i didn't ever really get into like i said i think uh was that on playstation i think this was my xbox days that mm. yeah that when fallout came out much so on I everything Oh, yeah. was it? Okay, yeah. I just didn't get... No, okay, well, Half-Life and this. I just didn't get into it, guys. Come at me. I was doing other things. I was playing Halo and things. I wasn't trying to get into this sci-fi dystopian exploration. I also don't like Bioshock, so anybody who wants to fight me, you can fight me. Oh, boy, uh, boy. Multiple yeah, grenades today. Okay. It's, it's kind of like steampunk throwback nostalgia, 1920 stuff. Like, it's not really my jam. Um, but I do like this series. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see, and I know this is just in the universe of it. It's not like directly related to any of the games, but I thought the show and in terms of kind of a, the, what we're talking about, you know, this new age of video game adaptations, uh, this show took the world of the games in from everything I can tell from social media and does a pretty good job of making you feel the beats, the quirkiness, the oddity, the danger, the kind of nastiness and edge of it and still retain it in a fun kind of way and i thought it did a pretty good job not perfect but pretty good job of making episodic television that was interesting to me as kind of like a journey i'm on episode six so i'm not done yet um i will say and this is just a personal issue for me i don't know about you guys but i'm of a certain age that i grew up walking uh watching like nick at night a lot to fall asleep and things like that or in the middle of the night and so this kind of music, I didn't realize this until watching the show, but this this music has like a big trigger on me where I was watching Fallout and I probably shouldn't say this on my company time, but like I was watching Fallout yesterday while I was working and I just randomly like passed out for like 15 minutes and like oh woke God. up and was like, what is happening? And was like, <laughs> and it keeps happening to me while I'm watching this show. And it's not because this show is boring. This show is never really boring. It's every scene is crazy. There's stuff happening all the time. It's the music. They have these sequences where People are walking around and you get these kind of like great visuals of the wasteland and the apocalypse and these quiet moments where people are just traveling or walking. But every time they start a sequence like that and the music starts, this old time music is like some kind of weird trigger for me that I just start like, 
I get it. I, I, I look like, as what? someone who fell asleep to mash in mash's intro a ton like because yeah. that was just on or cheers is another one exactly. like those cheers, those yeah. theme songs yeah i get it i get you I get, i'm with you i understand okay so yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah i listen to my like... dad listen watching sports so da -na -na, da -na -na. is that what janelle fell asleep to <laughs> yeah but yeah, little, yeah so... like the squeak of basketball shoes gets me to sleep it's crazy <laughs> yeah so it, it just kept doing that to me and i'd be like and I just keep nodding off and I'd be like, God damn, and wake up and be like, but anyway, that's not, that's like I said, that is my personal problem. That is not at all some low key shot at fallout. I've really enjoyed this series. Um, it's weird. I like all the, I think what's carrying it for me are the performances, like the actors involved. Uh, what's her name? Purnell and uh, the guy who plays Maximus. And of course, Walton Goggins as the ghoul and all of that wow. is really great. And you know, Man, shout out to just adding Walton Goggins to things and like completely elevating seriously. Them. Yeah, because the Cooper yeah. Howard Ghoul thing is just so powerful. Oh. I know Matt did not like that opening scene. And Matt's like a hardcore girl. Oh my know. god, talk about a. But I mean, but like, talk about doing its job, right? But I was that was wrecked me. I was like, what? That's a that's as strong a first half of a like pilot. Like, you know how I always hold the Walking Dead's pilot in high esteem because that is one of the best pilots ever for me. Like, that just left such an indelible mark and made such an impact of, like, the tone of the show and what this show was going to be. And that first half of the pilot for Fallout is exactly that. Like, my God. Like, that just sets the tone. But, yeah, that that was a scene. I actually rewatched that scene, like, twice because and i feel like we can get in the spoilers on the pilot right i i'm mm -hmm. i'm five episodes in so i'm right behind you um so i'm not completely done with it uh you know i'm only really you know I, things took me away from just watching the whole thing because it's i'm enjoying it that much uh it's you know fantastic uh but i but i think that scene where like you get the bomb like the explosions and the way when they're riding the horse right and down the road and like they're going that was like phenomenal that was just done so well it just like hits you in the gut like th this show does that a lot um even when you see certain things coming right like you know something's off especially in that first episode right there's there's things that are like oh something's off and even when you can see like this isn't something's coming it's the way it's executed that still throws you uh for for a loop and so i just think they've it's it's fantastic it feels like this game brought to life and i i've said this bat uh when we when we kind of talked about it on uh quick save is that like back when it was like the trailer first hit right it was like i've been spotty on the fallout games like i haven't played every single one um but like because like new vegas is one that's like left like it's kind of one of those marks that I, I feel like i need to get to at some point because it's so beloved um but you know played fallout 4 and and some of the other games right um and so I just think like they did such a beautiful job of bringing it to life. And I think not adhering to a certain story was smart. I think it was a good strategy so far. They are executing on that. I am happy that they're all out there, the episodes, because I can watch at my own leisure. It takes my time into consideration and I'm very happy about it. Uh, all I want to do is, is finish it and I hope it does well so we can get a second season. I'm completely opposite. I hate <laughs> that they dropped all these episodes. It is so it. annoying to me because I'm on a podcast where I have to scramble to try to watch them all in like three hours when I'm road tripping across the country. Like it's, it's very frustrating. Like it makes it very, very hard to digest and really appreciate each individual episode like so i only watched the first episode because i'm stubborn and i don't want to ruin this show for myself because this was my most anticipated show of the year so <laughs> i even wrote kobe i was like i don't know if i'm gonna be able to get through these like i'm gonna be visiting my parents and i really don't want to watch this on my cell phone in a car when i can barely even hear it um so I, I hate, I hate this binge like culture that the pandemic gave us. One of my favorite things about Shogun has been weekly episodes. Finally, again, with my husband, we get to sit down, we look forward to it. Um, and that is my only criticism so far. I do love this game. I actually like would watch Twitch playthroughs of this because I just loved the concept so much um, that I was... Just, I honestly wanted to see it play out from the beginning. Like, I wanted to see what happened after they took off on on 
the horse and like see them trying to get to the vaults and like people like scrambling to get into the vaults, um, which we might, I might see cause I haven't gotten that far. Um, but this, like, this is, I agree with you, Matt on like, they, they're nailing the game. Like I, I have no criticism of how they're portraying the game, the one game that I used to watch, which I don't even know which one it was, but it feels so so good like i i love this i'm so excited to keep watching it but i am gonna watch it weekly <laughs> yes and that's your choice yep. because it allows you the yeah. choice to do that it's the only pe yeah. how are people it's pissed nuts. that they gave you a choice like that's well, like, so it's ridiculous like, to me it's, it's <laughs> like <laughs> did we do no this in our culture like, you, you oh my god the initial like twitter like buzz and then it's just well, who cares about twitter <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's about Twitter. My Bro. experience with like my community on Twitch, like I love like when there are weekly episodes, I get online and do live streams and talk for hours about weekly shows. So I, you know, even here, like I wish we were going to talk about it next week. I wish we were going to talk about the next week. I wish we were going to talk about the next week. I would rather talk about this than Shogun, but because <laughs> everybody binged it. Everybody binged it. So there's so many grenades being thrown today. Yeah, there's. I mean. <laughs> Uh, I don't there's so much to unpack there. Uh, I feel like Luke Skywalker in Last Jedi. I'm like so much of what you just said is I don't know wrong. why that's a grenade. Like why is it weird that I want to <laughs> share Oh, I was talking about the Shogun that. thing specifically. Yeah, the Shogun I was thing just is talking crazy. about the I just dis <laughs> my brain that's disregarded all. that. Yeah, that's That's all I was talking about. There's I mean, no Shogun, way this show is better Shogun's than Shogun. Cool like, too, but like it's the only show, it's the only thing we talk about weekly on this podcast. We've been it's talking about X-Men 97, thing. Invincible, like whole Halo. We've done all of that. You guys do bonus episodes on those. So you have to remember, I only get to talk to you once a week. Also, I got to say, no one cared about the Invincible ones, That's too. That's true. That is true. <laughs> and those were, because those were buried, and they were weekly. I'm just yeah. saying, like, yeah. we have the choice to talk more about a show if it's good. And I yeah. think that should, look, that's also partially on us. Not as like comic book nation. I'm just saying, like no. I'll say, like this genre of what we're doing right now, in in particular, is like talking about a thing. Like that's on us to keep talking about it if we enjoy it. And there is a right. there is a movement to talk about the newest thing, and I get that. Uh, you know, but but at some point, like I'm not gonna fault someone for giving me the choice. That's considerate of my time. I like that I had five episodes. I could watch five episodes. I didn't have to stop, and I don't have to wait for timmy or joanne to like i don't have to do the same thing that they do like it it suits my time <laughs> and i'm okay with that like, okay whoa with janelle that. chill out bro i'm like matt is the one that just screamed my ears out i've had to take my earbuds out <laughs> twice this episode because he's screaming on his mic here's the thing. tell no, matt to chill out I've Listen, I've been doing this since like the 2010s. I had a whole separate other podcast. Go listen to Screen Ran Underground, where we also nearly split over the question of binging versus yeah, weekly we when this was all new. This isn't new. We've been here for like a decade. Like mm -hmm. there, and it depends show to show. Like Stranger Things has never lost hype. It doesn't die because it's a binge show. Like Stranger Things is fine. Other shows, obviously, House I'm, of the Dragon, we don't I'm need. I'm gonna throw out. Like we need to like, yeah, weekly. So it depends on the show. I'm going to throw out a parlay. <laughs> What's that? I'm, I'm going to throw out, I'm going to throw out a parlay and just talk about how much I like this show. Yeah. <laughs> I think that regardless yeah. of whether or not it's coming out all in a block this is why or if it's coming here. out on a weekly, on a weekly installment. I think that with fallout specifically. So, uh, uh, like, like Janelle and Kofi and, um, Matt, I, I did play, I loved fallout three. I loved fallout new Vegas. I loved fallout four. I played fallout 76. Uh, <laughs> and, um, I think that one of the things that's really so tough when it comes to adaptations like this is really capturing the spirit of the original property. I think that like, you really have to thread that needle when it comes to placating old fans of the property as well as bringing new fans in and fallout uh amazon's fallout is able to kind of really do that because it's able to take what made the games work so well which is its quirky personality the 50s aesthetic and the music that puts kofi to sleep is uh there and present in the show itself while also creating really compelling characters i think that like lucy and uh maximus and the ghoul 
uh, all of them are really interesting and their worlds are interesting. And there was never a time in this series where I thought I didn't feel bored in terms of jumping to a storyline that they had set up. And so um, I'm, I'm looking, they do, I have seen all of the series, all of the season and without going into any spoilers, they do set up some big stuff for season two that fans will be happy about. So I'm looking forward to that. I didn't know if season two was already confirmed. Uh, I saw some folks in the comments were saying that it was, Yeah, uh, but I'm here for it. Whether that be released all at once or whether that's released on a weekly basis, I'm here for whatever Amazon decides. I think they'll keep their strategy. <laughs> I don't think they're going to change it. <laughs> no, uh, Nobody but, listens to me. It's what, are you, what are you guys talking about? Like, are you guys smoking crack? Like, Amazon strategy is to release a binge season first to get people into the world of the show. And then they quickly switch to weekly after that when they come back. So Fallout <laughs> season two will most likely Maybe be Maybe they a learned release. from Invincible. <laughs> they're not going to do but it. But there's, <laughs> there's so many crazy things. I don't want to get sidetracked because I'm already like, yeah, I could... We could just derail the show on this one subject alone. But I just want to say, like, you guys realize, like, the reality we live in, right? Like, nobody watches anything uniformly anymore. Like, it doesn't matter if it's weekly or binge. Like, somebody is going to come along in two months from now. Because some half of these people go, I'm going to watch it, but I want to wait till it's all there, even though it's weekly. They'll be like, I want to wait till the whole thing is done, and then I'm going to watch it all. So we have those people too. So somebody in two months is going to come along and there's going to be a whole renewed round of Shogun is amazing or this is amazing or this pundits are making livings and getting paid for talk about stuff. And then come like four years later and they're like, I finally watched this movie. Let's do a whole recap. Watch through guys, join my feed and let's talk about this movie from four years ago. And you all are making money off this. Like it's all absurd. So eh, I, I think it's creators like, don't make as much as the ones that are doing like weekly. Breakdowns. Well, thank God that means the world still makes sense. Uh, but <laughs> like you should not, you should not get paid just because your opinion is being expressed because you finally de deemed to watch something. So we're all uneven. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the model so much kind of, it's just, does the show have staying power is really the question <laughs> and to punch through and stuff. Fight, yeah. fight, fight. I love the cut. The comments are amazing. Stop. You guys Thank are you nuts. Guys all right. But uh, I think we all, Demon listen, there is no back. fight here. Thanks, I think David. the bottom line is that we all agree people should watch Fallout. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, yes. absolutely. And if you, okay. yeah, like talk to us about it because I feel like we're all really excited about it. Yeah. All right. Now let's go on to two shows that were definitely better than Fallout, and that was X Men '97 and Shogun oh, this week. Here we go. I'm just kidding. I'm just starting trash, but uh, talking trash over here. But um, X Men '97 did punch us in the gut. You could go to Phase Zero uh, and listen to their feed for the kind of more in depth breakdown of this. I'm just here to say that, like, with this, and I wrote a piece uh, that's kind of just basically saying this is the X Men we need in the MCU. Like, I don't care if they directly poured over this. This episode had a little Watcher reference. If you didn't catch it, their Watcher is in this episode of X-Men 97. Kind of already suggesting we could see some multiverse shenanigans happening here. But um, what this show is doing in terms of taking the comic book campiness of X-Men and those storylines, the kind of modern socio-political sensibilities, and, you know, something that still fits like it could be a major... Block, but like premium superhero franchise and mixing that all together. Oh, in the soap opera messiness of it all and, and putting it all together out there. And uh, it's pretty astounding product. Like it, it's, it's nuts. I never had any faith that this series would be able to do what it is doing now. And, you know, I'm always happy to eat crow when, when the taste is good. And this is some pretty tasty crow because uh, this episode was next level for just X-Men cartoons, Marvel animation and animation in general. Um, and taking some of the most serious X-Men stories and kind of turning them into this level of an animated series. So I, I was question. blown away. Yeah. Um, was was the original series like super similar to this, at least in like, I feel like this is adult content. Like, I feel like this, this is a like this is for adults. This is way more violent. And they let is a lot it, of okay. slide in this. I'm so glad I started with this one because I'm with you, Kofi. Like, this is incredible. I, I cannot believe that I like this more than Invincible. I'm shocked. I'm, I'm just loving the X-Men, which, you know, if you're 
a long time listener, you know that this has been kind of a struggle for me. I've been kind of walking that line. Like Matt has been urging me slowly, like, hey, we're going to get you this comic because you'll like this and this will be easier for you to digest and understand the background. But God, this is like, I'm a fan. This is incredible. And I'm really, yeah, I'm, I'm sold for sure. Matt, say something. Uh, man, so this is, no, this is fantastic. Uh, this was, I did not, uh, you know, we've already seen them lean more into the adult you know, themes and things like that in this series, but for them to take it as far as they did in this, uh, just the depiction of the battles themselves and the, the twists and gut punch moments along the way, like, man, it's this episode, which is something else. Like this was uh powerful. What was this half hour? It felt, I mean, it, it yeah. felt like, you know, yeah. five minutes, but, uh, it, but, and it, it has all the, like, you know, uh, like monumental feel of like an hour of prestige television. I mean, there's so much happening here. There's so many big moments. Uh, it was, this was fantastic. Uh, just, and I also, man, talk about retro framing, like a title and having the title be so tied into that final moment and what that means for the character. I'm trying not to spoil it here about what like happens there, but like, good God, like there's just so many emotions. Uh, and I'm really curious to see like, if we do the multiverse stuff or we do, you know, obviously, I mean, they set it up with, you know, a uh, cable of like, you know, like you've seen this before, right? So they, they leave the table there that they could undo some stuff if they want to, or like this didn't happen or whatever. But I don't know with the kind of the way they've handled it so far, like them just leaving it with the big changes that were made here and moving on from there would be something the show would do. Like it has the you know ability to do that. So I'm intrigued to see where they go next. Um, But man, just fantastic. I mean, look, I loved Fallout and I am in on fallout uh but this was the best thing i watched oh i'll, I'll wait this hands down this this, this left the I biggest impression on me on this that, left the i can agree with you hey hey yeah, yeah. look at us look at us like, look at us everybody go. agreeing yeah, over just, the darkest so episode of x-men 97 to take. yeah i i think that um uh and I totally agree. Uh, this this episode in particular, it's the best one of X Men ninety seven. I think it's better than Fallout. Um, one of the one of the things that the showrunners had kind of said uh, behind the scenes for this was that this was they the creators um, had people that they lost during the Pulse nightclub shooting, as well as they wanted to elicit the idea of like nine eleven and how the time when the original X-Men animated series was made and where we are now as a country, as a world, you know, it feels more dangerous. Like, and there are more things that can seemingly happen out of nowhere where things just seem scarier. And there's the possibility, certainly like throwing cable into the mix and having Nathan Summers pop up is like, Oh, maybe they undo it via time travel. They have done that in right. the series before, but the, um, the weight and the emotional i thought one of the most one of the most striking moments of this recent episode for me personally was magneto telling uh leech uh that not to yeah. be afraid in german because of course magneto lived through the holocaust and was originally german and had to deal with all of that horror and all of that terror and everything and just how hard that hit emotionally i mean there were so many emotional moments in this and hopefully i i think they're confirmed already for like three seasons in total but hopefully this just keeps going forever please just make this the m make this the mcu's x-men i mean I think seriously like at, at the at yeah. the end of at the end of the marvels we got the post-credit scene with a kelsey Grammer beast that looked like x-men 97 well that's piece, what i wanted so. to say yeah all the mm. right now there's and i wrote this piece about it and it kind of goes back to that it's like all indications right now are there's no reason to believe that's not happening we've had kelsey mm -hmm. Grammer's beast in the x mansion professor x with that music in doctor strange and the watcher showing up in this one and like it's just like this is what we need from the x-men we need the colorful costumes the soap opera mess plus the seriousness of the subtext and the subject matter that they take on so it's like, yeah, we don't, as much as I want the Krakoa era and all that, we can't put that on screen. We don't need to go back to the black leather. We already did that. Like, we actually need comic accurate stuff. 
So it feels like this is just the testing waters and like, yeah, port this over to live action through this multiverse crap. And at least we've done something valuable. We always knew we were getting the X-Men out of the multiverse crap. But if we get this version, like, yeah, hell yeah, let's do it. So that's just me. Um, some of these castings in the comments, you guys are, like I said, I got to get on this new crack. You guys are on that new crack. I got to get on <laughs> so I can be linked to them. Um, yeah. Oh, my God. Handling just oh my God. school, family crises and doing a live show. It's always nuts. Um, all right. So let's get into uh, what we're talking about here. Matt, we don't have to cut your agenda. Let's just say. Um, we don't have to get too deep in it, but uh, if you guys think Shogun wasn't isn't operating like on a completely different level than these other shows right now, then we're just gonna have to agree to disagree. We don't have to go down a rabbit hole of argument. But for me, like Shogun episode eight and what happens here is by the end of this episode, you know, X Men almost got me. By the end of this episode, I was definitely shedding like at least a tear for just you know the power in kind of the power in themes and the philosophy that this show is working with and the things they do and why they do them and all the characters is insane. And yeah, this is still my best of 2024. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I get it. Other people are entertained by other things, but it's not even like worth getting, like I said, too deep. I just think the show is working on such a higher level than pretty much everything else underneath it, that it's, it's hard to compare for me. But um, all right. If anybody has any deep thoughts on that, we can get into it. But uh, I'd rather get into some of Matt's stuff and talk about some of this Ultimate X Men because that is something we got to address before we get out of here. <laughs> you want to do that real quick? I yeah, let's do wait. that because because that is yeah, let's do that because I'm okay, very so, excited yeah, yeah. about this. Yeah, yeah. So we read uh, Ultimate X Men two this week, right? Um, and <laughs> what an intro. you know we were very hesitant on the first one we were like okay let's see what peach is cooking with like let's just let's be cool let's just see where we're going here um but it's two issues in and peach momoko is you know the artwork is great like the vibe is great if you had told me this was like a manga a marvel manga series or something i'd be like oh that's pretty cool but uh this is an X-Men to me. Like, I'm sorry, guys. Like, this is an X-Men to me. This has now become some, like, weird kind of teen angst thing. Even this version of Storm we get in this, and as we're starting to get to powers, I'm already kind of out, man. Like, I don't see, like, what the appeal is. I don't see... I, I don't even know, like, how this book was really, like, something that they were like, okay, let's take one of our major franchises at this point, at this junction, when X-Men is in such a pivotal place as a brand and they were like, let's do this. Um, it, it's, I'm not, I like Peach Momoko and I think the work that could be done in other places would be great. But as an X-Men book, like there's nothing in the DNA of this that makes me say X-Men. There's not like a group of character dynamics. There's nothing like they're just getting to the powers. Like this is all kind of a weird, weird experiment. And I, Alt and I'm just, I'm sorry to say, unless there's one hell of a third issue, I think it's ultimately like a really going to be a quick failed experiment, especially with like X Men '97 resurging right now. But that's just me. see what you did there. Ultimately, that's good. That's oh, good. I didn't even notice that. <laughs> <laughs> Janelle, what did you think? Because we just talked about your slow <laughs> introducing to the X Men. What What do you think of this? Kofi is nailing this. Um, I also shout outs to my dog Yondu in the back. Sorry. Yay. <laughs> He's named after Yondu. Um, come here, buddy. What do you think of X-Men Ultimate? He's shaking his head no. Um, it's I I have like a it's weird. I, I, I like it for what it is. Like it is something it it's not X-Men. And I'm, I agree with you, Kofi. And I like I, I think it's interesting and the artwork is pretty and all that fun stuff but it's just not x-men it's not so i you just can't watch like 97 and then read this and be like yeah i didn't even know that was storm kovi i didn't even know like i didn't even it didn't register for me i was it's just it's very I don't know. I don't want to call it a letdown or anything. It's just totally different. And and if you are going to read it, you need to make sure you're going in 
not expecting a traditional X-Men book and you just kind of have to appreciate it for what it is over there, separate completely. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, anime I agree with you. vibes. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I and I will. I will call it I, I just it's a letdown uh for me. Um I just the the artwork is beautiful. It is a stunning book. There are several spots in here that are just gorgeous. And Momoko's work in general is gorgeous. Um, but the difference with like this. Wait, and, Matt, sorry like, to interrupt you because comments are coming from us. Yes, we know the character is not Storm in the book. Her name is May. We get that. But she has a lot of Storm-esque personality traits oh, like lightning okay. earrings and controlling weather so okay you're helping me thank you kofi uh, yes. for explaining she's in, uh, yeah. there's a, there I'm is so a storm <laughs> we we meant that she's the storm archetype yes even though there's a storm in the black panther ultimate ultimate thing but yes you guys can, you, 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 know what? you guys you can stump for this for as hard as you want you can but call it whatever it. you want you can start a May fan club. I'm still not gonna give a May. Okay. I just, like, I just, it's different when it's um something like Demon Days where it's running alongside. It's not stepping in when when you're making it the core book. Which you know I've look I've really enjoyed uh to this point I think as far as solo books anyway all of the ultimate entries i've really enjoyed them so far obviously spider-man stands tall above the rest for me but like i i dig that so when you're leading with x-men which as kofi mentioned is at a as popular as it's ever been and you can credit also a lot of that for these for the nostalgia of 97 and what that's brought back attention to that classic version uh you know the krakoa era has been a success and revitalizing them and then we're launching this new era that's kind of also trying to harken back to some of the nostalgic elements right x-men is as popular as it's ever been so for you to then go i'm all for trying to take big swings and do something different uh it's just this story is not clicking for me as a as a story like not even if you take the x-men out of it <laughs> you which by the way you totally can because that means nothing to what's happening here uh i just don't I, I I'm not invested at all. And it has done nothing to really grab me and pull me into this world. That is so pretty. So I, I think it's, it's biggest issue is that it, it didn't lean, it, it leaned too far into kind of trying to do its own thing. And I applaud that, but it is called ultimate X-Men at the end of the day, and it needs to do something to align with those things. Um, and also, you know, look, it's not like this book exists in a vacuum. There was an ultimate X-Men run back in the day, just along with ultimate Spider-Man. And it was pretty, you know, it was pretty popular, <laughs> did a lot of stuff. So it's being held up against that too. Um, I just, it's just not working for me. So it is gorgeous. Uh, I think I'm, I'm kind of out. I think, I I'm think I'm out. I, I don't think well, I'm giving yeah. it a third issue yeah. to really hook me. I'm just kind of going to be like, oh, what's happening and skim. I don't know if I'm, I'm in, um, have you been keeping up with this Evan? Yeah. Um, in so much as I have, uh, I read issues one and two, and I think everybody is pretty much spot on with, I think one of the biggest complaints is like, it shouldn't have been called Ultimate X-Men and it shouldn't have right. been released f like right at the forefront of trying to establish this new Ultimate Universe. I know that, um, uh, I believe when we kind of, when me, Kofi and Matt, I think we had talked on the pull list about uh, uh, when we talked about like Ultimate Invasion and we talked about Ultimate Spider-Man is the idea that maybe this shouldn't be called an ultimate universe. This should be called something else because it's so far removed from that idea. And this in particular, like th this just came out at the wrong time and it came out with the wrong, like marketing and wrong title. Like, I think they should have me, they should have taken a different route with ultimate X-Men. And then this should have come out as like ultimate armor or like ultimate, or something, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, something something like that. And just if you're establishing the X-Men, it needs to be like, uh, uh, I appreciate trying something different. And as as Matt has said, the art is gorgeous. I think it's, it's really striking. Um, but it needs something more, especially when you compare it. It's really tough to compare it to Jonathan Hickman's Ultimate Spider-Man because that book is so good. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. But... Uh, <laughs> um yeah it's 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 just one of those things where it's like i <laughs> i hope for the best for it in the future and i just think that it just needs something you know and um yeah x-men yeah. would be a good start 
<laughs> Maybe the X Men. She's up in an X Men book. Who knows? <laughs> all right, all or right. Storm. All right. Stop. I don't or wanna, Storm. I, I like Peach Momoko's work, so I don't want to get. Oh, into absolutely. This. Yeah. So I'm not trying to. Yeah. I'm not trying to be mm-hmm. dogpiling on this, but it's just nah, nah, it nah, hasn't nah, gripped nah. me, and it's just unfortunate because it's it's a good time. Matt, take us out with your agenda. Let's talk about. No, it. we don't have time. We don't have time. It's okay though. We'll we'll get back to it next week. I don't, we Star don't, Wars we don't has a new video game coming it. out. Go check that out on comicbook.com, Star Wars, and check out everything on our feeds. We have a whole bunch of shows on our feed. This week, we have a Joker trailer reaction. We have Anime Initiative, where Evan and the rest of the anime crew breaks down the whole thing. Matt will tell you everything else in comics on the pull list. Quick save on Thursday. Got into Fallout. We have a spoiler and non-spoiler in-depth podcast about that. Otherwise, just come back here every Friday for the live show. This has been me and my Micro Machines impersonation. We still do not trust you. Never have. We are still here. Comic Book Nation. The only show that does it all for geek culture and the official comicbook.com podcast. Subscribe now. Thank you. Peace. Standing <laughs> over Kofi. <laughs>